Well, when fighters spend an extraordinary amount of time in their local gym, some people say they live at the gym. Up until a couple days ago, that was the literal case for many of City Kickboxing's finest. The head coach of CKB, Eugene Behrman, joins us now. Eugene, how did that idea come together to have all of these different fighters literally living at your facility? Well, it's just, it's just something we had to do, to be honest. Um, the last, the previous time we locked down, we all got stuck at our, uh, all, everybody got stuck at their separate houses. And so we weren't able to train together. We, everybody had to train by themselves. This time, before the deadline arrived, we quickly all moved into basically the gym and that operated as a household and we all bubbled up together in a group of 10. So we had to do that to, to, to get a good quality training out for these fights coming up. So many people have described City Kickboxing as a family. That family element, I'm sure, was tested in that time. Who did you discover may not make the best roommate if, if you were to have to do this again or on a permanent basis? Uh, definitely Israel, if, if I'll be honest. Um, uh, I don't know if it's the last couple of years. He's had a lot of things that have uh, been done for him by uh, other people. But um, yeah, there's not much initiative there, which I would have liked to see more. He's not very good at the dishes. Let's just say that. <laughs> well, I heard through the grapevine that your early morning song choices weren't the most popular. <laughs> what is your official on the record defense to that? Hey, look, this is my, this is my happy place. Uh, this is where I live most of my life in the gym. So I'm very comfortable. Um, I definitely, there's a way that I act that I wouldn't necessarily act uh, in front of a camera or in public. So obviously some of the boys uh, have been um, sneaking some video of me singing, but it's 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 better than it's better than it appears on camera anyway but i do want to ask about yeah. the four different fighters from ufc 253 who are fighting on that card how did the living circumstances that you have at ckb affect your ability to prepare four different guys for four different opponents yeah i mean living together and just having a concentrated effort in the gym and me not having the distractions that i have at home actually helped I didn't want to go through what we went through with Dan Hooker and Alex Volkanovsky, where we didn't have our proper training environment. And so just moving in together was just a must. We had to do it so that we could maintain our, our, our usual environment that we prepare for a fight of this caliber. So um, it, it actually helped. Eugene, a practical question for you. I know oftentimes when fighters from the same gym have multiple teammates on the same card, sometimes their ability to have an ideal corner isn't there. Do you yet know if you're going to be able to corner all four fighters at UFC 253? As far as I know, yes, yes, I will be able to corner all four. So, um, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I don't have 100% confirmation on that, to be honest, that, uh, now that you bring that up, but, um, it's important. It's very important to us that um, I'm there for all four guys. Well, there's been so much discussion about octagon size and the impact it has on strategy. And anybody who's seen any of your fighters fight know there is so much importance in the detail, the cadence, the rhythm, the range, the footwork. I mean, down to the centimeter. It is so nuanced. How does octagon size difference impact how you game plan for, say, Israel v. Costa? Yeah, I mean, the differences are, are subtle, just like you mentioned. Um, and they are, I mean, I would be telling a lie if the plans aren't slightly different because they're definitely going to be different plans. Um, but in, in all honesty, it wasn't too important that whether we had the bigger one or the smaller one, what was more important is that we knew um, as soon as possible that so that we had the most amount of time to prepare for us it didn't make a difference whether it was a small one or the larger cage what we really pushed for is just to um get word early on which cage it was and now we've kind of got that um we can make our preparations around that israel tells a story about when he was preparing to fight kelvin gastelum that tremendous fight of the year candidate that it was that 
You told him, hey, if this guy has a good poker face, stick with the game plan. You're going to be touching him. He will wear over time. How much of that advice have you had to translate to this Bohachinha fight? Yeah, I mean, that a lot of that is going to translate over. Uh, uh, Paulo Costa has a very good, uh, uh, you know, resistance against um, getting punched. And he has a very good poker face. He's able to come forward through a lot of shots. Israel just has to have faith um, that those that accumulated damage is having an effect because it can you can easily be psychologically impacted by someone who seems to be um, not being affected by your shot. So he's he's Israel's a little bit too much of a veteran to be to let that become a factor. I think. We've seen Costa again and again take a straight line approach. How much do you think Coach Eric Albaracin is going to evolve that for an opponent of Israel's caliber? That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the I think the obvious things are they're going to try to cut Israel off from going left and right, but. Um, we would be silly not to prepare for that as well. So he, he will definitely have to evolve it because we don't necessarily go back in a straight line unless it's intentional. So there's plenty of video there for both camps to study. So it's going to be very interesting in that respect. From which other opponents of Costa's have you looked to, I guess, for inspiration for what has worked? The guy is undefeated, but it's not as though he hasn't had some measure of trouble and some people haven't been able to get an upper hand against him. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's different things you can take from a lot of fights. Obviously, there's the Uriah Hall fight. You can take it. You can find, We can look at that as a good study to find some openings. There's the Romero fight to some degree, um, although Romero is completely different style. You can always take little tidbits, but I've... I've actually looked at a lot of Israel's previous fights in the kickboxing um, ring and some of those opponents are very close to the style of Paulo Costa that we've been game planning and dealing with for quite a few years and I've looked to some of those to kind of rehash them, some old techniques and some old game plans uh, kind of out of the bag if you like. And again, Israel's just one of four fighters from CKB on this card. Kai Kaur Brown gets Brandon Royval. We saw Kai beat Tyson Nam in Auckland in February, that after a loss to Brandon Moreno at UFC 245. How have you seen Kai grow as a fighter since that loss to Moreno? Yeah, I mean, Kai's, uh, that's the thing. With that fight, there's only a few adjustments that Kai needed to make to make a huge difference. And now what you've got Kai doing is setting up his shot better. He has a lot of power, um, but he he doesn't always have the precision of like an Israel or a Dan Hooker. And I think that's what we've added to his game um, since that fight, just being more selective. Elsewhere on the card, Brad Riddell facing Alex De Silva. And if not for the tremendous fight that Dan Hooker had against Paul Felder in Auckland, Riddell might have back-to-back -back fight of the night bonuses in his back pocket. I remember against Magomed Mustafaev, he had that thing where he was, you know, posting the crowd on and you and I spoke post-fight and it was clear that I enjoyed that a little bit perhaps more than you did. How much do you take into account Brad's aggressive style once the octagon door shuts when you are game planning weeks and months ahead of time? Yeah, absolutely. I have to take that into account. Brad's a guy that uh, I have to hold back from being overly aggressive. He he has a tendency to um, want to exchange a lot, want to like uh, be a little bit less tactical and a little bit more forceful. But Brad is actually strategically is probably one of my best fighters. It's just keeping him in line with that game plan. And again, the Brad Riddell is a guy that they for one or another reason, Sean's um, throwing him to the wolves in his first three fights. This, the guy that we're fighting, Alex De Silva, is uh, by no means a pushover. Um, if, you know, when Brad gets this one, it's going to be put him in very good stead for where he's got to go to next. They've, he's fought three very tough guys off the bat. 
And last question for you, Eugene. I, I don't want to overlook Shane Young. It has been a while since we've seen him in the octagon. He faces Nate Landwehr. We last saw Shane 18 months ago at UFC 234 in a win. It's been a long time. Where has he grown as a fighter in, in, in the interim, in the last year and a half? I mean, Shane's one of my favorite fighters. He's this, this, the subtleties that he does for a fight are missed by most people. And uh, he had some pretty major personal problems and, and a pretty horrific neck problem, which was potentially going to end his career. So um, to have him back, uh, even all the guys are ecstatic when he was on the verge of never fighting again. Um, I mean, he, he's in that time, he's evolved more mentally than physically, I'd say. It's been a bit of a spiritual journey for him. I think he's in a very good place to take on another tough opponent. Yeah. Eugene, I want to follow up on that quickly. Uh, Shane has been very candid yep. about those mental hurdles he's overcome. In your role, what is your balance between preparing somebody physically and technically, but also helping them prepare mentally for a very taxing sport on the mental side of things? Yeah, it's something that I've got gotten better at over the years. The mental side of the sport is, is just something that hasn't necessarily been my forte. I've completely concentrated so I've concentrated on strategy and technique. But as the years have gone by, and especially with this new generation of fighters, I've kind of gotten more into looking after the mental side of the, the sport and making sure that their minds are in the appropriate place to be competing at this level. So especially with Shane, I've done a lot of kind of molding and uh, giving him messages and just making sure he's, he's in the right frame of mind. So it's a big, bigger part of the sport than it was uh, even five or 10 years ago, but it's part and parcel of the job. Eugene, it sounds busy as ever at City Kickboxing. I'll let you get back to it. Thank you for being so generous with your time and all the best in your continued preparation for UFC 253. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.